Thank you very much for this really great invitation to present at the Zero Prostate Cancer Summit this year. Uh, hello from Toronto, a uh, beautiful city. This is it, Toronto looking at its best with the CN Tower and the Sky Dome. Uh, it looks gray, miserable, cold, and snowy today. Uh, my disclosure is I've had research support from Exact Imaging and I'm a consultant to Mir Scientific. I'm going to mention both of these uh, products during the course of my talk. Let me just begin by expressing my appreciation to the work that Zero does. The efforts in public awareness, in education, in advocacy are really so important. It's had such a major impact. It's been such a a great help to those of us who are working in this field, trying to move the needle in terms of improving treatment, reducing side effects, reducing mortality. So I thank you for your efforts and your interest and enthusiasm. So the talk I'm going to give today is really focusing on the advances in the field of active surveillance for the favorable end of the prostate cancer spectrum. And there's been a lot of activity in this area in a whole range of domains. Uh, a lot of better understanding of the molecular genetics of grade group one or Gleason six, as it used to be called, and how that compares to higher grade cancer. And the key point is that about 90% of grade group one prostate cancers actually have essentially normal molecular genetics comparable to normal tissue. I'll come back to that. Developments in improving patient selection, the impact of age, race, family history, and so on. Germline testing, obviously been a huge development in the last three or four years. Developments in imaging, refinement of MRI, new imaging modalities like PSMA PET, high resolution micro ultrasound, biomarkers, new biomarkers, more accurate biomarkers, more available biomarkers, predictive nomograms to really identify what is this individual patient's risk, modeling that have really emphasized the robustness of the active surveillance approach, even if uh, there are some patients who, despite the best efforts, go on to progress and have incurable disease. The long-term outcome, a criticism of this whole initiative for the first 10 or 15 years or so was that, you know, you wait uh, with longer outcome, you'll see patients are going to start doing badly. We now have that long-term outcome. There's many hundreds of patients followed for 20 years conservatively, and it simply has not happened. Follow-up strategies, a better consensus on how to follow patients, who needs biopsies and imaging and how often. Influences in the tumor microenvironment, I'll address some of this, uh, both pro and con, how it's favorable, how it's unfavorable, how you can influence it. And finally, dietary and other innocuous interventions that may improve the outcome of patients diagnosed with favorable risk prostate cancer. So the bottom line is there's a lot happening. I'll try and touch on what I consider to be really the major advances in the area. Uh, just uh, some acronyms that are widely used, and I'm going to just show them here. I won't uh, explain them again as we're going through a PCA for prostate cancer. GG is grade group. Uh, this is a, a change in nomenclature. What used to be called Gleason 6 is now grade group 1, Gleason 3 plus 4, grade group 2, and so on. Uh, we use these acronyms in the oncology field, OS for overall survival, CSS, cancer-specific survival, progression-free survival, AS for active surveillance, ultrasound. And then I'm, I'm going to show what are called forest plots a few times. And this is the best way currently to display the results of a huge amount of data. So what this is in this particular forest plot is a summary of seven individual trials. So each one of these is in it would be, for example, a randomized trial. Each one has its own results. This is the odds ratio or the likelihood, for example, of one treatment being better than the other. And then you see here the summary statistic, which is overall putting all these together, uh, what is the size of the benefit 
or the harm. And if you look at, uh, at this part of the graph, unity means no difference. That's the vertical line. Each one of these lines, the, the square is the size of the trial, the number of patients, and the horizontal line is the confidence limit. So just uh, uh, to make sure everyone has a little bit of familiarity with this concept. So I know there's a lot of interest now, it's considered somewhat historic as to the genesis of this whole concept and where it came from. And essentially this goes back now approximately 25 years. Uh, and I went out for a lunch meeting with two of my radiation oncology colleagues, Richard Chu and Cyril Danju. I think it was no accident that this was a multidisciplinary group. I do believe that innovation in, uh, in science comes about through the meeting of minds with different backgrounds. And we had assigned ourselves for this lunch meeting a mandate to reduce overtreatment of prostate cancer. And the context was I had trained with Willett Whitmore, who was my mentor, uh, the chief of urologic oncology at Memorial Sloan Kettering, where I did a lot of my training. And he had this aphorism, is cure possible when it's necessary and necessary when it's possible. In other words, uh, you can cure the favorable patients who maybe don't need a cure, and you can't cure the ones who have life-threatening disease. So this was kind of a rhetorical question, but it was thought-provoking. And then you had a number of, I would say, key uh, innovators and opinion leaders in the field. Nicholas George from Manchester, uh, Jerry Chodak from Chicago, Peter Albertson from New Haven, who had each published what I considered to be really uh, superb papers raising the specter of overtreatment that, in fact, the majority of patients were not at risk from dying of prostate cancer. So our reasoning at the time was that most of the patients we were seeing, this was about eight years after PSA came out. So we were still seeing this huge spike of incidents from the use of PSA. Most of the patients we were seeing had a mild elevation of PSA, went on to have a biopsy and were found to have low or intermediate grade prostate cancer versus the ones who had advanced disease almost all had a high PSA and higher grade cancer. So it didn't make sense to watch these patients and see if we could pick them up around the time of the transition to more aggressive cancer and treat them at that point. This, this was not rocket science, although at the time it was considered uh, a very, uh, I would say, provocative and challenging approach. And so the strategy we came up with, track the PSA, do the biopsy from time to time, intervene if their PSA kinetics look bad, rapid rise, in other words, in the PSA, or their grade became worse, there was the brand new Prostate Cancer Research Foundation of Canada. This was their first uh, grants uh, competition. Uh, we applied, they gave out one grant, which we were awarded of $35,000, allowed us to establish a prospective database, and we got the ball rolling. And now it is here more than 20 years later, there's about 1,500 patients in our database and many with more than 20 year follow-up. and we had our first publication in 2002, we had 250 patients, we had no deaths, and this really led to a firestorm of controversy. And you had Pat Walsh, who was the, really the, the god of, of prostate cancer, the chairman at Hopkins, who devised the nerve sparing radical prostatectomy. And his view was that the Gleason six patients were the ideal patients for nerve sparing because you could cure them with a high degree of confidence. They had a low chance of a positive margin. Uh, you had data from large databases like ones called Capture uh, of tens of thousands of patients that around 95% of these patients were being treated with either radical prostatectomy or radiation. You had a real pushback from the profession, uh, including statements like this is unethical, that patients will die unnecessary deaths, and that uh, people like myself who were promoting this conservative approach would be responsible. And also the cynics who said, Klotz, you'll never convince American physicians to stop treating patients. They're too invested in it, both 
professionally and financially. Good luck with that. Well, it's a different world today. The, I would say the inflection point came about 10 years ago when the US Preventive Service Task Force looked at PSA screening and said, this is not working because too many patients with indolent disease are being overdiagnosed and overtreated. And this is based on the well-known fact that essentially your chance of harboring some prostate cancer increases with age and it's, it's about equal to your age as a percentage. So, you know, around two thirds of men over the age of 65 will have these microfoci of prostate cancer. We, until PSA, we had no idea who had this after PSA and, and a routine biopsy when it was elevated, we were finding a lot of these patients. So that was kind of a wake up call and uh, opinion changed rapidly. And so I would say today, no one really disputes the principle of conservative management for these patients. The controversy is really regarding the application. Uh, who is a candidate? How do you select them? How do you follow them? When do you decide to treat? How do you treat the ones who need treatment and so on? So we've learned a lot uh, since those early days. We've learned a lot about the molecular genetics. I mentioned that most of these grade group one or Gleason six or Gleason pattern three, it's all the same thing, uh, resembles normal cells in most cases. The implication of this is that grade group one is a non-metastasizing cancer. There are almost no cases in the whole world that I'm aware of, and I've been tracking this for some time, where the patient had a grade group one cancer that was removed surgically, the whole prostate was evaluated, there was no higher grade cancer, and they went on to have a recurrence and a metastasis. It can invade locally into the seminal vesicles, into the capsule. That is actually sufficient criteria to call something cancer. And there are other cancers like basal cell cancer of the skin, some brain tumors that never metastasize as well, that do invade locally, that are considered cancers. So there is a move now to change the term so that we would no longer call grade group one cancer. I'm not sure if that's going to succeed or not. I do think that grade group one cancer, although it doesn't behave like a cancer the way people think of it as a kind of lethal disease, it does fulfill the basic pathology criteria for cancer. So this is called a heat map of genetic aberrancy. And it's a little bit technical, but I just want to point out one or two things from this. this these are individual patients, each one of these, uh, many hundreds of patients. And the second line here is the Gleason score for each patient. It goes from light blue, which is grade group one, to dark blue. And what you see here is called a heat map of genetic aberrancy or another term is the average genomic risk. And basically what you see is it's not completely black and white, but there's a strong trend at the favorable end uh, with few genetic aberrancies. Cancer, of course, is a genetic disease uh, where the genes involved in cell regulation are altered. Uh, at the favorable end, it's mostly light blue or low grade. At the unfavorable end, it's mostly dark blue. But you see there's a few outliers, and the, the metrics are that grade group one, 2% of grade group one are in this highest, this worst quartile or worst quarter of the genetic uh, aberrancy. As soon as you have any Gleason pattern four, so that makes it Gleason three plus four, or grade group two, seven times more patients have significant genetic aberrancy. So, the, the key point is most of these grade group one patients are very favorable. There's a small proportion who are not. And uh, we now have many prospective data sets involving probably around 15,000 patients in total with long-term follow-up. I'll just show some of the recent ones. This is the one from Johns Hopkins, which is now over 1,800 patients median fault five years, 0.1% um, prostate cancer mortality at 10 and 15 years. You really can't do much better than that. 
they had a restrictive approach to eligibility. In other words, they only picked the very low risk, the most favorable patients, and the payoff was really very few, almost no prostate cancer deaths. They did treat a lot of patients. So you see by 15 years, about a third of patients um, have been treated with some kind of definitive therapy. This is uh, uh, the most recent data from Memorial Sloan Kettering, almost 3,000 patients, mostly grade group one on surveillance. And I just want to emphasize here, the overlapping curves are the risk of upgrading and the risk of treatment. So the approach that they took at Memorial Sloan Kettering, which is the same that we take, there's really only one indication for treating patients, and that is an increase in the Gleason grade to higher grade cancer. So that means that two criteria which are often invoked, which is bad PSA kinetics or a rapid rise in PSA, or an increase in the volume of low grade cancer are not considered criteria for intervention. And I believe that's correct. And here you can see they're a little more liberal with their selection. So 1.5% of patients metastasize at 15 years. Just to emphasize, there is no totally risk-free strategy, but I would uh, argue that even if these patients had all been treated with surgery or radiation at the time of diagnosis, you would still have this small rate of, uh, of metastatic disease. These are the patients who likely had metastasis from occult higher grade cancer at the time of diagnosis. So some of the questions that come up, what about young men or those with a strong family history? The thing about young men is that they have longer to live, obviously, therefore longer duration of exposure to an adverse event like progression to metastasis, but they are also much less likely to have high-grade disease that you don't know about. So this high-grade disease develops with time, and here is a systematic review. This is the forest plot I referred to earlier of a number of different studies, and you can see that Younger men have a lower risk of biopsy progression, of upgrading, and so on. So while they're, they have a longer period of exposure, they have a lower risk of actually having adverse disease. And this is uh, some data that we recently published in collaboration with a group at Harvard. We had more than 400 men under the age of 60, which is considered young for prostate cancer. And followed with active surveillance. And this shows the men younger than 60 and over 60, absolutely no difference in the likelihood of grade progression or metastasis or anything else. So uh, there was this idea that if you found it in younger men, it was a more aggressive disease. This is simply not true. Race is a little different. There is evidence from quite a few studies that African-American, African-Canadian men uh, diagnosed with low-grade prostate cancer have a higher risk of harboring higher-grade cancer. And whereas it's around 30% in Caucasians, it's around 45% in African-Americans, but they don't do any worse. So the idea is uh, the whole concept of active surveillance is you track patients, you repeat their biopsy and imaging, you find the higher-grade cancer at a point where it's still curable. and uh, here is a large study, 8,700 men, showing that while more African Americans were treated for progression, there was no difference in the overall mortality. So this is, I think, very reassuring. The next topic I'll just address briefly is germline mutation. So I think uh, this has now gone from something that no one had really heard of to now being very much sort of in the, uh, in the air, uh, and that is this uh, genetic predisposition to uh, uh, a defect in the pathway that is responsible for co correcting genetic errors. So cells are dividing all the time. Uh, the, the billion base pairs have to copy themselves uh, accurately. And it's they don't do it with perfect accuracy. So uh, cells have these very sophisticated mechanisms to identify errors and, and either cause the cell to die off or correct them. In patients who have these uh, germline mutations in DNA repair, of which the most important are called the BRCA mutations, that doesn't work properly. And what happens is 
Here, this is shows sporadic prostate cancer, where initially you have, say, loss of a couple of key genes that are act as tumor suppressor genes or growth regulatory genes. And over time, you have gradual accumulation of other abnormalities and eventually uh, worse disease. With the germline mutations, there's this explosive accumulation. As soon as you get the initial inception of, say, low-grade prostate cancer, uh, the, the mutations accumulate extremely rapidly. So this is not a good basis for a strategy of active surveillance where you're counting on the disease remaining stable. And we now have a couple of studies in the literature that essentially show, and this, this is from Hopkins, 26 men with DNA repair mutations. Here are the ones with bracket two. And uh, you can see the likelihood of upgrading is almost, this stands for hazard ratio, is almost three times higher with the BRCA mutations compared to the patients who have normal uh, germline genetics. And you can see here about 80% at 10 years have progressed to higher grade cancer. My guess is this was actually closer to 100% and they just missed it in the other 10 or 20. So um, the implication of this today, I would say, is that patients with BRCA mutations are one group who active surveillance would not be advisable in. Another aspect of this is the importance of follow-up. So uh, we and most groups have really mandated that patients get a biopsy, a second biopsy, a year after the initial diagnostic one. And then a biopsy, we do it about every three to five years after that. And we went back and looked, did it really make a difference? And it really did. So this, uh, some data we reported last year, looking at the patients who complied with our mainly with our biopsy protocol versus the ones who didn't. And in fact, this is cause-specific survival, likelihood of dying of prostate cancer, the likelihood of having a recurrence, the likelihood of having metastasis, all significantly worse in the patients who, who refused to uh, undergo the subsequent biopsies. And, and I think this just emphasizes the point, you have to follow patients. What about imaging? Huge developments in this field. This is just a, a classic example. This is a guy who had an elevated PSA, had a systematic biopsy that showed Gleason 3 plus 3 in one core. In the olden days, the first uh, roughly uh, 18 years or so of surveillance, we would have done a second biopsy, probably not found much. Today, he gets the MRI. The first thing that's remarkable about this is the kind of detail you see is really extraordinary. And the lesion is right there. Now imagine putting a needle in from behind and hitting that blindly, almost impossible. Today, targeted biopsy, and it showed four plus three, and the patient had a radical prostatectomy. And here you can see the two cancers. Here is his little microfocus of Gleason 3 plus 3 of no consequence whatsoever. And he had a large cancer at the anterior, the upper part of his prostate that was really the life-threatening one. So this is the kind of case that I think uh, early on would have accounted for the uh, 1% to 2% of patients who metastasized while on surveillance. Today, we find these much earlier due to imaging and targeted biopsy. Uh, so MRI has been a powerful tool and, a, and really changed the game, but it has important limitations. It's not real time. It requires specially trained radiologists. Uh, it can miss lesions. It's expensive. It's complex. A lot of people are claustrophobic about going through the MRI core. People have pacemakers and hip implants that prevent the MRI from uh, giving a good image, or it's too risky. And uh, so not all people have insurance coverage. And certainly in many parts of the world, the resources to provide MRIs to patients are lacking to all the patients who need them. Uh, it's also not very accurate in terms of volume. This is one of the main limitations. And this study showed that the average uh, prostate cancer volume was about 50% greater than the size of the lesion seen on ultrasound, on, uh, pardon me, on MRI. So you can see here, there's a fairly large lesion. 
doesn't look as big on the MRI. And this is a study from UCLA that took patients who had radical prostatectomy and had had an MRI prior. And these patients, the most interesting ones were the ones who had multifocal cancers. So they had several cancers in their prostate. This is very common. And you can see down here, the, the light brown bars are the proportion of these cancers that were missed on MRI. And where you had multifocal cancers that were in the five millimeter to 10 millimeter range, about 75% of them were missed on MRI. It's not perfect. And this just shows an example in the surveillance setting. So this is, these are MRIs of the prostate on three different patients over about a three or four year time period. Uh, here, they're concordant. The, the MRI was stable. The repeat biopsy didn't show anything different. Here, they're also concordant. So you see an increase in size from B to E, and that corresponded to progression. So, so far, so good. Patients' uh, biopsy show great progression. But here's what we worry about. This patient also had a stable MRI, but his biopsy showed progression. And it turns out, unfortunately, that MRI misses progression a lot of the time. This is a study of, on this from Sloan Kettering. About a third of men whose MRI was completely stable on surveillance were actually upgraded on their repeat biopsy. So that leads to the opportunity for some other imaging modalities to, uh, to have a role. And the one that I am particularly excited about is this high resolution micro ultrasound. So the key advantage here of high resolution ultrasound is higher uh, frequency gives higher resolution and conventional ultrasound is about 200 microns or 0.2 of a millimeter, which allows you to image the prostate very well. It allows you to guide needles into different parts of the prostate, but it doesn't allow you to see the anatomy of cancer very well at all. With the high resolution micro ultrasound, it's about three times greater resolution and you see the anatomy of the prostatic ducts, which is altered in prostate cancer. Um, that's what it looks like. It looks like a regular ultrasound machine. And this just shows an example. This is kind of the low resolution setting and this is the high resolution setting. And you see this kind of speckled pattern in the peripheral zone or the back part of the prostate. And you see, um, this is what gets altered in prostate cancer. And, and you simply cannot appreciate this with conventional ultrasound. I'll just, and, and this gives an example. So here's a nodule susp suspicious for cancer. You see it very clearly. This may very well have shown up on MRI, but would probably not have shown up on conventional ultrasound. So here, uh, if you had done an MRI, you would have to have a fusion technology to superimpose the MRI image on the ultrasound. You hope it's accurate. Here, you just, you see it and you line it up and here comes the needle, boom. You can be absolutely sure that you have targeted that thing appropriately. You can do it transperineally. I think there's a move now to transperineal biopsy, which is, I think, overdue and a very welcome development in this field to reduce the risk of infection. Um, and then this is an example of a transperineal biopsy. So here the needle is coming not through the, the rectum from behind, but through the skin behind the scrotum, which is called the perineum. And there's the lesion, there's the needle, uh, very accurate targeting. And this is some data that uh, I published not too long ago from the first 11 centers around the world to start using this micro ultrasound. And essentially what it showed, this is the um, sensitivity here on this forest plot from each one of these sites was actually better than MRI. It actually was better at identifying cancer. The specificity, which means the likelihood that what you're seeing is truly cancer was about the same. And here is some better data, which is from a, a blinded study, a rigorously done blinded study where the patient had an MRI and then ultrasound, but the ultrasonographer was blinded to the findings on MRI. And you can see th this is the score of the MRI. It's called PIRADS. And the score of the ultrasound is called PRIMUS. 
for each score, the likelihood of finding significant cancer was about the same. So it really looks like it performs about as well as MRI, considerably less expensive, much less complex technology, potentially much more widely available. I mentioned the transrectal versus transperineal biopsy. This is, an, this is something that should change. I think uh, we need to move away from transrectal biopsies, which cause harm to a significant number of patients, including death to somewhere around one in a thousand to one in 10,000 from an, uh, sepsis now. While that's a fairly low number, for the patient who experiences, it's a complete and total catastrophe, uh, obviously. Um, it can be done with local anesthesia, and uh, there are some disadvantages. It's not quite as easy to target certain parts of the prostate. It's actually easier to target others. Um, and there's now some data coming out comparing the diagnostic accuracy of transrectal versus transperineal biopsy, and really they look very comparable. Uh, this is kind of an interesting story. So uh, this is the wife and daughter of a guy named Rohr Gobrinson, age 68, who had a um, transrectal biopsy <clears throat> in Norway and developed acute infection and died from the infection. He's one of the one in five to 10,000. And uh, this compelling, uh, his compelling family learned about this, learned about the option of transperineal biopsy, created a public relations campaign to end transrectal biopsy. Uh, this caught on in Norway. And although there was some initial pushback, eventually uh, there was uniform national adoption of transperineal biopsy in Norway. No one there is doing transrectal biopsy anymore. So it just shows you how public pressure can have an influence on clinical practice, and so it should. Intermediate risk disease. So there's been a fairly good adoption for grade group one disease. What about higher grade cancer, particularly grade group two? So this has some of the Gleason 4 pattern, which is the real cancer, but still many of these are indolent. Uh, not all are indolent. And we early on were very inclusive. We included lots of patients who had grade group two cancers. And after 15 years, we found a significant proportion of them had metastatic disease. So we pulled back. But there are patients, particularly if there's a very small amount of pattern four. So you see patients where it's 95% pattern three, 5%, excuse me, or less pattern four these patients really behave like grade group one in most cases. Uh, this is the area where molecular markers like Oncotype DX and Prolaris uh, can really help to stratify patients. And the other option for these patients is focal therapy. I think for a lot of grade group two patients, radical prostatectomy is really over treatment it's more treatment than they need. Uh, and so surveillance and focal therapy is very appealing for a lot of them. Biomarkers. So there's a profusion of them now. It's become quite a confusing area. There's, you can look at protein, DNA, RNA. You can look at every bodily fluid, uh, urine, semen, blood. This is a summary of the commercially available biomarkers that are out there, some in blood, some in urine, some in tissue. They're all trying to do the same thing, which is predict who has got aggressive disease, who's got indolent or benign behaving disease. There's a big range in price. The liquid ones are cheaper. The tissue-based ones involve micro dissection. You have to pull out the specific cancer cells from the slide. So that's labor intensive and they're up in the $4,000 range. They all seem to work about as well with uh, area under the curve, which is a combination of sensitivity and specificity of around 0.8 to 0.9. None of them have been compared head to head, by the way. So the differences in this performance, you have to take a little bit with a grain of salt. And there's other ones coming down the pipe, all of which look very promising. Um, what about the tissue-based assays? 
So there's a conceptual problem with these that I just want to briefly touch on, and that has to do with the problem of genomic heterogeneity. So this is one of several studies that address this. Uh, these are a group of individual patients who have multifocal cancers. So each one of these patients has at least two, and in many cases, three or four individual sites of, of different cancers in their prostates. Prostates were removed, and they, uh, they did sequencing of all the genes in each one of those cancers. And what you see here, the gray is the unique mutations, the brown or the orange is the shared mutations. 95% of the mutations that these cancers had were unique. In other words, they weren't shared by the other cancers in the same prostate. So if you do a biopsy, you send the material off for one of these tissue-based $4,000 assays, and it comes back and it tells you what the molecular aberrations are in that particular biopsy specimen. Unfortunately, it's not telling you a whole lot about what's going on in the other cancers in that prostate if they are present. So that's a significant limitation. Now they do work, they are predictive, but um, that's why at the moment at least, I, for, for many patients, prefer the concept of the liquid biopsies, which tend to, which get genetic information from every cell in the prostate. The one that I'm particularly excited about is called the uh, sentinel assay, which is based on urinary um, micro RNAs that are excreted in the urine in exosomes, which are shed by cells, particularly cancer cells. There's many thousands of these have been described. This assay involves selecting out 442 RNA sequences each one of which was predictive for the presence or absence of cancer and higher grade cancer. And this shows these exosomes, which are packaged by cells and secreted in the thousands by each cell. They're very, very tiny, but they contain important uh, uh, genetic information, particularly these micro RNAs. And this is from the initial publication, which I was involved in that shows uh, the, the sensitivity and specificity called the area under the curve, extremely high for the presence or absence of cancer, the presence or absence of prostate cancer. So you see, this is the area under the curve, 0 0.97, 0 0.96, compared to about 0.7 to 0.8 for the other assays that I showed. So this is this has not uh, been approved yet by the FDA, but it's coming and I think could be a game changer. And I think why it's a game changer along this one, as well as the others, is that the idea is dynamic risk profiling. So you imagine you have a patient on surveillance and uh, he has a, a genetic assay, uh, urine or, tissue or serum based that's negative and you follow him and you repeat the assay and it switches to positive. And if that is an accurate assay, that is a flag that now this patient needs to be reevaluated or possibly even treated. And this would mean we can get away from the serial biopsies, which really are a disincentive to patients. So this is coming. Uh, it's, it's not going to be here next month, but it probably is going to be here within a year or two. And then the other aspect of this is artificial intelligence, which is obviously uh, seeping into many aspects of our lives. But the challenge in this specific area is that you get an increasing amount of data, including data about the individual patient's lifestyle, maybe his genetic background, his biopsy, maybe some of the molecular aspects of his biopsy, the results of biomarkers, uh, and so on. How do you put all of this together? And AI really has a role. And there's a number of initiatives to pull together all of this information on tens of thousands of patients, which would then allow you to really get accurate risk profiling. The final thing I'll address is, can we prevent progression or failure or an adverse outcome by innocuous interventions? Uh, why? Because patients like to feel they're doing something. One of the limitations of surveillance is for your typical alpha male, uh, who, who is a sort of intervention, type of guy, likes to get things done, it, it can feel a bit passive to just be watching uh, 
and looking for disease progression. So it gives patients a sense that they're doing something. A lot of these proposed interventions have other health benefits. You can improve the patient's diet and lifestyle and perhaps have a benefit in terms of cancer progression. The first is exercise. If exercise were a pill, we would all take it. This is just a, a graphic showing the eight or nine different ways that exercise has been demonstrated to improve the uh, tumor microenvironment in prostate cancer. It improves uh, something called epigenetics, uh, immune function, cytokine levels, hormone levels, and so on. Uh, stop smoking, of course, the single most cost-effective intervention in all of medicine. Uh, there's data that you have a patient who's newly diagnosed with a cancer, and the specialist spends two minutes telling him this is a sign for you to stop smoking. It's actually quite effective. So I really encourage this. And finally, dietary modification, weight management, moderate red meat intake, fruits and vegetables. I, I, I call this the kind of motherhood recommendations. Uh, we actually now have some data about the effect of exercise in prostate cancer. This was a recent randomized trial, small trial, 52 men on active surveillance. Half of them got high intensity interval training, HIIT, for three months. And the other half got basically a pamphlet. And the men who did the HIIT had improvement in their fitness, but their PSA went down. So this is not the most robust uh, indicator of a favorable effect, but still, it really is suggestive that something beneficial is happening as a result of the exercise with respect to prostate cancer. Of course, there's the cardio, uh, cardiac fitness as well. This to me is one of the most fascinating recent developments about the impact of obesity. So it's been known for many years that obese men uh, do worse as far as prostate cancer. They tend to have more, uh, uh, more metastasis, greater risk of high-grade cancer. They tend to be diagnosed later. And now for the first time, we understand why. And uh, the reason has to do with the effect of obesity on the tumor microenvironment. So it turns out that obesity induces what's called a metabolic tug of war between the tumor cells and the immune cells infiltrating those tumors. And essentially what happens is the tumor cells increase their fat uptake in the presence of obesity. And somewhat paradoxically, the immune cells are deprived of necessary uh, fat substrate called free fatty acids and impairs immune surveillance. And this may result in a more aggressive cancer. Uh, and then finally, what about dietary modification? Uh, this was just a study uh, published in JAMA recently by the group based in Los Angeles, where they took a 443 patients and randomized on surveillance and randomized them between aggressive dietary intervention towards a more vegetarian based diet and a pamphlet. And did it make a difference? They did this for two years. And perhaps not surprising, it was a completely negative study. So the, the patients who had the active intervention did alter their diet, but it had absolutely no impact on any prostate cancer endpoint, PSA kinetics, or the results of the follow-up biopsy. And here is the risk of upgrading, essentially exactly the same. So I think the message is that Ultra, a diet over the course of one's lifetime has a huge impact on health. Uh, but once you're diagnosed with prostate cancer, other than uh, reducing obesity, it probably doesn't make a lot of difference at that point. Perhaps it's too late. Perhaps it takes a lot longer than two years to see this effect. And then you have men who really want to be proactive. They say, look, there's got to be something I can do to stop this. And there are three things that I advise men who ask about that to do. I emphasize there are no randomized trials. There are trials being carried out now, but there's no randomized trials published that show the benefit of these three things. But for all of them, there's a lot of inferential and indirect data. Vitamin D, low-dose statin, and metformin. And this, each one of these kind of a long story, but first vitamin D, and this I really emphasize, this is a northern climates like Canada, where 
uh, because of reduced sun exposure in the winter, vitamin D deficiency is ubiquitous among elderly men. Uh, and there's a lot of data. This is another forest plot showing the relationship between vitamin D level and prostate cancer mortality. Very significant evidence of increased mortality in patients who have low levels of vitamin D. This costs about three cents a day. It has no adverse effects at the dose of 1,000 to 1,500 units. I recommend it. The second is statins. Now, many people are on statins to improve their lipids and for the cardiovascular benefit, but there's also a lot of evidence that being on a statin can reduce the risk of progression of prostate cancer metastasis and uh, prostate cancer likelihood of dying of prostate cancer. So these are, again, a summary of all these studies showing evidence of a benefit favoring statin. Statin does inhibit something called the mevalinate pathway, which results in some molecules that can stimulate prostate cancer proliferation. So there's very good preclinical evidence to support this as well. Uh, so I encourage men to go on at least a low dose of statin aside from the lipid benefit. And then finally, metformin. Metformin is the old diabetic drug. Uh, at a low dose, it does not lower glucose excessively in men who are non-diabetics. And through two pathways, a direct and an indirect pathway, it uh, favorably influences cellular metabolism and inhibits cancer, prostate cancer cell growth. And uh, we are actually doing a randomized study of metformin in men on surveillance in Canada at the moment. But look at this, there's 30 non-randomized studies of metformin, 1.6 million men mainly diabetics on metformin or not, and how did they do? And overall, you can see very significant benefit in terms of um, a uh, reduction in progression in metastasis in prostate cancer mortality in the men who were on um, metformin compared to those who were not. This again, is not a randomized trial, but it is a huge population-based database. I think the results are quite compelling, particularly given the the really uh, very innocuous uh, effects of metformin really has no adverse effects in almost all patients. So I'm cutting to the end of my talk just to show now the uptake of active surveillance. This is in different regions of the United States. The blue line is the increase from uh, 2010 to 2016. Um, of the use of surveillance, it, it really has taken off. There's still room for growth in Canada. It's around 90% of eligible men with grade group one prostate cancer managed this way, similarly in Scandinavia. United States, it's around 50 to 60%, but it's still improving, I would say. And then finally, just to summarize how we manage patients, Initial diagnosis based on a 12 core biopsy with targeted biopsy if targets identified, MRI within the first year if it wasn't done before, PSA every six months, repeat that biopsy within a year or within the first few years. Uh, MRI we now do about every three years with a targeted biopsy if there's any change. And based on some of the data I showed about the limitations of MRI, or high resolution ultrasound. We still do the biopsy now, but every four to five years, transperineal technique, it's much more acceptable to men intervene basically for grade progression. And as I mentioned, we're moving towards a different world where we can rely, for example, on a urinary biomarker to identify the patients who are at risk. I'm gonna skip this slide. Thank you very much for your attention. I hope we have some time for questions and discussion. Thank you again for the privilege of giving this lecture.